I really love what we're talking about today. Um, We've been in a series called Prequel, where we've been looking at uh, just a couple of the many, many prophecies written hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born that were fulfilled in him. And uh, it's astounding when you look at the details of some of these prophecies and, and how they were fulfilled in Jesus. But what's so interesting is that when they were written in, in you know, those hundreds of years before, people really struggled to understand what they meant. I mean, you think about it. If, if, you, if Jesus hadn't come yet, and you are reading in the scriptures about a virgin giving birth to a baby. You're like, what? About human baby be- being called mighty God, everlasting father. You're like, I don't know what this stuff means. What, what, do, we get, what do we expect? What can we expect? But then when Jesus was born, it's kind of like, I, I like to use the illustration. You know how when you, you get out of the shower and the steam is in the room and you're looking in the mirror trying to get ready and it's all foggy. Then maybe you pull out a hair dryer and you, you blow off the, the steam or, or you just wait long enough. And then all of a sudden, it's like the fog just goes away and instantly it feels like it's clear and you can see yourself. That's kind of how it was for the Old Testament uh, prophets and all of the people. The rabbis, they would argue about different teachings and these prophecies and they'd go, no, I think you know, the virgin giving birth is gonna me- means this. And no, I think it means this. And they would just debate and try to figure it out. And then Jesus was born, and it was like, boom, clear image. That's what they meant. It's, it's really interesting to me. I say it all the time, and so forgive me for those of you who are like, okay, we get it, we get it. But Christianity is not blind faith. We don't believe blindly. In fact, all of our beliefs are based upon events that actually happened in history, I mean, 2,000 years ago, whether even outside of the Bible, there is no doubt that a man named Jesus was born at around 33 years old. He died on a cross. His disciples were completely dejected. And I mean, they believed this was the Messiah, and now he was dead. And they were upset, miserable. They thought the movement had ended. Yet something happened a couple of days later. We know what it is. It's the resurrection. But in that day, all of those disciples said they saw the risen Jesus, and they went from dejected to changing the world. And you think about it. 2,000 years later, in a land that they didn't even know existed, you know, North America, we're sitting in a church worshiping the Jesus that they saw live, die, and rise again. They could not have imagined this, yet here we are. Our faith is based upon upon actual events that happened. And these these events, to me, it's just astounding. Hundreds of years earlier than when they happened, the prophets were giving us snapshots about what Messiah would look like. You know, how would he be born? What would he do? Who, Who was he? And that's what we've been looking at the last couple of weeks, these prophecies about um, who who the Messiah, who the Christ was, was going to be. But today is going to be a little bit different because we're going to look at something a lot bigger today, something even more significant. We're going to look at why he came today. What was the Messiah's purpose? Now, I realize when I bring this illustration up, it is a sore subject today, but the last couple of weeks have kind of been like going to a Packers game early. Now, I know there's a lot of mourning today, and I get it, you know, it doesn't feel like a Merry Christmas for some of you Packer fans, and I get it. But try to remember a time before Aaron Rodgers was hurt. (laughs) Try to remember when there was hope and you had had Super Bowl aspirations out in the front. And try to remember or, or, or imagine going to a game before the injury early. I actually had a chance to do this I've like, I'm a Miami Dolphins fan. I've been to one professional regular season game in my life, and it was a Packer game. All right. I know, and it's okay, because it, I, I said it was, it was kind of like a spiritual experience all in itself. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I had joked, I put on Facebook, and a lot of people loved it, so if you get offended, I'm sorry. But I had put on there that it was kind of like <clears throat> um, going to Lambeau Field to see the Packers was like a Baptist visiting the Vatican. You know, it's not your team, but you know you're on holy ground. And that's kind of how it felt. 
And so, you know, we got to the game, and I got there early because I was driving from Sun Prairie, and uh, so I'm in the stands, you know, and, and it's filling up, and they got the music playing, and it's just, it's, it's kind of rocking, and as the crowd almost was full before the game, they had those crowd games, you know, they're like shooting things and inviting people onto the field to do stuff and win prizes, and there was all that kind of stuff, and then they were showing videos of great Packer plays from this season and the last season, and, you know, it really set the mood, right? They're, they're really trying to give perspective, and it's, it's all part of the experience, and it's fun, and you love it. But everybody in that stadium knows why they bought the ticket. And it wasn't for the pregame stuff. They came for the main event. And that's kind of what we've been doing the last couple of weeks as we've been looking at these prophecies. What is the Messiah going to look like? What, what, what is he going to do? Who is he going to be? And those are kind of like all of the, the pregame. It's, it's perspective. You know, we saw that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. For unto us a child is born. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. We, we saw that through, through this Messiah, the kingdom would come to earth and we would see what the kingdom was going to look like. But today, we get to talk about the main event. Today, we get to talk about purpose. Why did Jesus come? I mean, what, what was this expected Messiah supposed to do and why? Why was he going to do it? So pregame's over. Today we get to start the main event, and um, we're going to start in a weird place because we've been going to the Old Testament prophecies, but today, and we're going to spend some time in the Old Testament today, but I want to start with a prophecy that's in the New Testament. It's in chapter 2 of the book of Luke. Now, we're told that right after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary are in Bethlehem, and they make the six, uh, the six mile, I was going to say six day, I'm like, no, they, they walked faster than that. The six mile journey from Bethlehem to the temple in Jerusalem, because they were going to make a specific sacrifice. And so what happened when they got there was completely unexpected. And that's where we're going to start today. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. You can look at the screens. We're going to be in Luke 2. It says now, it's supposed to, hold on. There it is. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. The consola- consolation of Israel just means that he was waiting for the Messiah to come and restore Israel to its former glory. So that's what he was waiting for. <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. He had revealed, the, the Spirit had revealed to Simeon uh, that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So moved by the Spirit, Simeon went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus, to, uh, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, now, let's back up, because I imagine, I remember we would be in like uh, a grocery store with our, our new baby, and all these people would come and, and touch the baby, and I would see my wife, the hair just on the back of her neck, stand up. She's like, you know, you're, t- you're touching my baby. And if anybody tried to grab the baby, you'd be like, Oh, punching him out. This is not going to happen. So I laugh when I see this at first because you can see Joseph and Mary and they're pushing Jesus in the baby stroller, probably not, and going into the temple. And then this, this old Jewish man walks up and he just grabs the baby out of her arms and he starts praying. And I'm like, you are so lucky that Mary was a nice person because I don't know if our family would have handled it. But I, that's not in Scripture. I don't know if that's what happened, but I'm just, I'm thinking if it was me, Simeon would probably have a black eye. And, uh, but anyway, so Simeon grabs the baby, and this is his prayer. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. I mean, he's like, I'm ready to die, Lord. I've seen the Messiah. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. That's most of us. And the glory of your people, Israel. Now, I'm like, how in the world did he know this? Because you could just imagine, Joseph and Mary are are coming to the temple. They're offering a sacrifice to God. Just a couple of days earlier, shepherds came from out of nowhere saying, an angel came to us and talked to, and said, you know, Messiah is here. And so, you know, it had been like nine months since they had heard anything and, and, uh, and, and, So you just wonder, how how did Simeon know what was happening? 
And, and he takes this baby and he basically shouts to God saying, our, dra- our greatest dream has been fulfilled in this little baby. His eyes had seen the Messiah. This was the one who was going to save the entire world. Not just Israel, all people. Through this baby, all people were going to have access to God. But then Luke continues. That's what he says. He says, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about, about Jesus. Then Simeon blessed them. And he looks right at Mary. And he says, and you can see it in yellow on the screen. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. So he said, you know, this new baby, Jesus, this newborn baby, he's not going to conform to what people expect. See, the Jews thought that Messiah was going to come and conquer those Gentile oppressors and, and restore Israel's glory to the way it was during the time of David and Solomon. But this baby, the real Messiah, he wasn't going to lead as anybody expected. The religious leaders would fall. But the poor and the lame and the sick and the dejected, they would be lifted up. And that included a lot of Gentiles. They couldn't couldn't even imagine this. This was so far out of what they expected that their Messiah, he would... He would be for the Gentiles and he would, be for, he would bring the, the wealthy those who, and, and the religious leaders, those who everybody thought they were obviously closer to God. He would bring them down and he would bring up those who everybody thought were cursed. See, for the Messiah, they couldn't imagine that bloodline wasn't what really mattered, but what really mattered was heart. They couldn't, believe, they couldn't, they couldn't imagine it. Jesus, this Messiah, was going to, in verse 35, reveal the thoughts, the innermost thoughts of the heart. But how? How is was, how was the Messiah going to do this? And that's what the last words of this prophecy uh, talk about. Look at the last line. This is Simeon talking straight to Mary. And he says, Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul too. A sword will pierce your own soul. Mary, you are not getting out of this unscathed. Your precious newborn son, he's not going to be what you expect either. He's going to upset you. You're going to fear for his life. He will continually walk towards rejection and danger. And eventually, Mary, your son is going to be hung naked on a cross and he's going to die as a criminal. And Mary... You're going to watch the whole thing. Because this death, your son's death, this is his purpose. Your baby was born to die. That was Jesus' primary purpose, to pay the penalty of our sin. His death makes it possible for anyone, anyone, to be reconciled with God. And what's amazing is this what I just shared with you was prophesied 700 years, details, 700 years before Jesus was ever even born. And that's where we're going to be for the rest of the day, um, where we talk about that first Christmas from Isaiah's perspective. So we're going to start in verse 5, if you, and you are welcome. If you have a Bible, this is one, this is one of those passages you mark, because you're going to want to come back here. This is, we're going to be in Isaiah 53, and let's look at it. We're going to start in verse 5. Now, again, 700 years before Jesus, this, these are words about the expected one, the Messiah, the Christ. And it says in verse 5, But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. You know, you look at that verse 6, all of us like sheep have strayed away, and you go, I don't know many people who would disagree with this, in that, you know, it seems like we all rebel a little bit against what is right. We're, we're all a little bit selfish, we're all a little bit self-centered. Even with our best intentions, 
We don't measure up to what we want to be. I was joking during the last service that, um, because it came to my mind and it's just so true. Uh, I would say that 95% of all New Year's resolutions are done by February 1st. All right? And then people laughed. And then I was like, except for me, it's probably like the second week of January. And I was saying, it's because in my refrigerator for the week after Christmas, we still have those chocolate-covered peanut butter balls. And no matter what I do to give myself some kind of New Year's resolution to lose weight and be healthy, those little peanut butter balls are the death of me. I can't say no. I want to. I, I tell myself I will. But it's usually when I'm full when I say that. Because when I'm hungry again, I could look at carrots, salad, leftovers, or chocolate peanut butter balls. And I lose every time. So I know I can't measure up to my own standard, which is to be healthy and eat right. As long as there is chocolate peanut butter balls in the world, I will fall. And I'm just admitting that to you now. But if I can't measure up to my own standard, how in the world could I expect to measure up to God's? Impossible. No matter how hard we try, we can't measure up. And I I would bet if I said, you know, raise your hand, if you measure up, you never screw up. Who's going to raise their hand because everybody would look at you and somebody would know you and go, you're lying. Let me just tell you about it. I mean, it's true. We can't fix ourselves. So God does it for us. He doesn't do it because we're good. God doesn't, he doesn't love us and, and he's not for us because we go to church or we read our Bible or we pray or we give to charity. No, the only reason that God takes on the punishment of us all It's because he loves us, and we were created in his image. That is it. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more. He loves you you so much that he died on the cross for you. There's nothing you could do to make him be more on your side. He's already on your side. He created you. You are made in his image. His desire is to walk with you, to walk alongside you. And that is impossible because of our sin. So what did did God do? He laid on the Messiah the sins of us all. Let's keep going. Uh, Let's look at verse 8. It continues, unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants. This is amazing to me, just some of the details about this prophecy of, of the Messiah. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He, he had done no wrong, and he had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Who could have imagined 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah would prophesy, saying that Messiah would be unjustly condemned, that he would die without descendants. He would have no children. That his life would be cut short in midstream. I mean... Jesus, he wasn't young and he wasn't old. He was about 33 years old when he died. But he was struck down for our rebellion, killed as a criminal, and buried in a rich man's grave. You don't make up a prophecy (laughs) about somebody who dies as a criminal and, and then is buried in a rich man's grave. That just is not going to happen. Yet that is exactly what happened with Jesus. Amazing. I was uh, just talking out in the hallway a, a little bit ago, and um, I was reading a story a couple of weeks ago. Um, a, a Jewish girl had read this passage, and she went to a rabbi, and he said, I know, it sounds a lot like Jesus. <laughs> it does. We don't believe in Jesus, but it does sound like him. She was so dumbfounded. She was, when she read it, um, she thought maybe this was just like an American version of the Bible. And so she pulled out her Hebrew Bible and read it, and it was the same words. And she was like, oh, my goodness. This is crazy. So why, 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 why is this going to happen? Let's keep reading. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He had no children. But when he dies for everybody, he will have many descendants. Many will come after him. Many will follow him, and he will enjoy a long life, it says, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant, this Messiah, will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. 
his anguish is he will, he will find satisfaction in his own anguish. The Messiah was going to die, would die. I mean, for Isaiah, it hadn't happened yet. The Messiah was going to come and die so that we could live. His main purpose was going to be an offering for sin. That is why Jesus was born. That is why we are here today celebrating Christmas. Jesus was born to die. And that's why John the Baptist, when he introduced Jesus to all of his followers, he said these words, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I don't know if, how familiar you are with Jewish history, but you know, what is the significance of the lamb? Because the lamb was an animal sacrifice, that, especially at Passover time. So they would, they would sacrifice a lamb, and the blood of the lamb was, it, was thought to forgive sins temporarily. Temporarily. But Jesus, Messiah, he was the lamb of God. When he took away sins, it wasn't temporary. Jesus took away sins permanently. Jesus' life had one destination, to die on the cross, to pay for the sins of the world. He was born to die. And in, so, I mean, in Jesus, God reached down to save humanity because we couldn't save ourselves. We were helpless. See, most people, and this is really interesting to me, if, if you do a survey around the world, not just in the United States, but if you do a survey, most people believe, like, if you ask them, how do you get to God? How do you find God? Most poli- people believe you have to do something. You have to change the way you live. You have to obey the rules, or you have to sacrifice something that you love. Maybe you need to free your mind or learn some kind of new knowledge. But the bottom line is most people think that to find God, you have to do something. You have to live a certain way. But Christianity says the exact opposite. Christianity recognizes that no one can find God. No one can live up to his perfect standard. It is impossible. Like I said before with the the little peanut butter balls, I can't even live up to my own standard. Seriously, if you have any peanut butter balls, watch out. I'm coming after you today. (laughs) I think I have enough control that I'll just steal them from behind your back. But anyway, no matter how talented, no matter how clever, no matter how smart you are, no matter how disciplined you are, we can't measure up to our own standard, let alone God's. It's in our nature. But that's why Jesus came. Because he knew that. He came to do for you what you could never do for yourself. See, God is too perfect. God is too good for us to ever reach up to his standard. But Jesus was his way of reaching down to us. He became man. He became one of us so that we could walk with him. See, Christianity is not about being good and strong and perfect. It's it's about honestly admitting that we're weak and imperfect. Christianity is admitting that we need help and that we're broken and we're incapable of ever reaching God on our own. See, Christianity recognizes that we need God to save us. We need him to fill us with his spirit so that he can begin transforming us to become more and more like Jesus. We can't do it on our own. We try. So many of us try and we fail. And we try again and we fail and we will never succeed. It is God living in us that transforms us. We can't do it on our own. See, that's the reason for Christmas. Jesus came to die to save us. Jesus came to die to save us. Do you know what Jesus, Yeshua, means in Hebrew? The original language, his name, Yeshua, means God saves. That is Jesus' name, God saves. And then that good news, God saves. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to measure up, stop trying, you can't do it. God has reached down to save us. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. We don't have to walk alone. We don't have to walk without hope anymore. You know, whether our life is full of comfort or pain, it's probably both. God wants to walk alongside us as Emmanuel, God with us. That's the message of Christmas. God became man because he wants us to follow him. He wants us to have a relationship with him, to walk with him, to participate with him in in bringing his kingdom to earth like it already is in heaven. You don't have to be good for God to love you. He loves you just like you are, and he's done 
everything necessary for you to be right with him. He's done everything necessary for you to be okay. He did it all. That was the whole purpose of Isaiah 53. That was the whole purpose of Jesus becoming man. That was the whole purpose of the cross, that we could be right with God. Now, in my home church last weekend, um, the speaker, uh, I guess I should say, you're like, wait, you were here last weekend. Yes, I was. Um, my, my home church in Sun Prairie, Heartland Church, they have services on Saturdays and Sundays. And so we usually go on Saturday as a family, and then I immediately leave and drive up here. And last week was a really good one for me because um, the speaker, he shared a song that has honestly been on my playlist for years. It's a Christmas song. And um, last week when he played that, I said to myself, uh, my family's going to know I'm stealing this because this is powerful. I, it was like I heard it for the first time. The song is um, called Celebrate the Day. It is a beautiful Christmas prayer that reminds us the, of the purpose of Christmas, that Jesus truly came to die. But the way the song ends It just pierces my heart. And I thought, um, rather than talk about it anymore, maybe I should just let you listen to it. So if you will look at the screens, I'd like to share with you one of my favorite Christmas songs. And with this Christmas wish is missed, the point I could convey. If only I could find the words to say to let you you've touched my life because here is where you're finding me in the exact same place as New Year's Eve from the lack of my persistency we're less than half as close as I want to be in the first time that you open your eyes did you realize that you would be my savior in the first breath that left your lips Did you know that it would change this world forever? And the first time that you opened your eyes, did you realize you would be my savior? And the first breath that left your lips, did you know that it would change this world forever? And so this Christmas, I'll compare the things I felt in prior years To what this midnight made so clear That you have come to meet me Those last four lines wrecked me. And I think about growing up, and like I told you, I didn't go to church, and and, uh, I 
I didn't follow Christ until I was in high school. And so all of those memories I had of being a child and the Christmas tree and opening all those presents and all of that never was surrounded with Jesus. It was just about Christmas. And, and then I remember last Saturday as I was listening to the song, I was thinking about, you know, I celebrate the day that you were born to die. I mean, that's today, Christmas. We're celebrating the day that he was born for the purpose of dying so that one day I could pray for you to save my life. And that happened for me when I was 15 years old, 10th grade. And I remember that day that I prayed for him to save my life. And every Christmas since that day has been so different. Jesus came to save your life. So my question as we close is, have you, have you let him do that? Have you let him save your life? You know, maybe you're like me growing up and, and it was just Christmas. It was just about trees and presents and all of that. But it's so much more. God, who loved you so much that he sent his only son that you could have everlasting life, which in that day, in the Jewish day, everlasting life was more than heaven. It was walking with God daily. It was shalom. It was living in peace with God. It was him being a part of every aspect of your life. That has been God's desire since the beginning. Have you let him do that in your life? Have you chose to follow Jesus and just say, I'm weak and I can't do it. I can't save myself. I need you. Maybe you have, and maybe it's been a long time. You know, in a room this size, we have people of all different backgrounds. Some have never chosen to follow Jesus. Some did and have just done their own thing for years. And some of you, you're kind of where I am when you hear that, and you're like, I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful that, that I'm walking with Jesus, no matter where you are. He is saying to you and he's saying to me, follow me. I've done everything. I've come for you. Follow me. Just say yes. I want to take you on a journey that will blow you away. So would you surrender and follow him? I promise you this, as much as I could promise anything, you will never be sorry. Let's pray together. Oh, Jesus, I don't understand a kind of love that would cause you to leave heaven, to come to earth, 2,000 years ago, to walk daily knowing that your purpose was to die, all because you wanted to reconcile with this world that rejected you. I don't understand that kind of love, but boy, am I grateful for it, Lord. Thank you so much. God, I pray that uh, in this place, each person, wherever they are, and I know there's so many different situations represented in this room, but I pray that you will touch each person's heart, that you will let them know that they are deeply loved and that all of this, all of Christmas was done so that they could be right with you. God, I pray, them that, pray that you will give them the courage, all of us, no matter where we are, give us the courage to say yes to you one more time, to say yes, I follow Jesus. And God, I pray that you will transform our lives so that we look more and more like you. And God, I pray that you will help us to continually be a people who honor and glorify you with our choice, with our decision. We love you. Thank you for Christmas. In your name we pray, amen.